Happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm excited, 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 a little nervous to be moderating, but I know that uh, I know Mackenzie and Naeem will have my back and we'll move this conversation along. Um, but my name is Minnie Corte Anand. I am a, a doctoral candidate at Georgetown University. Um, and I am the Senior Director of Impact and Innovation at Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Washington. And today this panel conversation actually is really going to be about what happens beyond the academy, right? What happens when you decide not to go into, um, into the classroom or into, into administration? What are some other things that you can do? Or even if you decide to go back, um, return after some time. So we're really going to, um, engage and we really want the chat to be popping. We want you to, if you have some comments and you want to unmute, uh, please let Marcus know, raise your digital hand or raise your church finger, whatever you need to do. And we're going to just have a really, really good time for the next uh, 82 minutes um, and, and really make this about a conversation because at the end of the day, we want to, we want to share information. Um, and the only way we can do that is if we all participate. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want if our two other conversationalists could introduce themselves um, and then I'll jump into a couple of questions and then we will most definitely ask you guys to, um, to participate. So Mackenzie and then Naeem, please. Certainly. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Price and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm based in Washington, D.C. I um, completed my doctorate at Georgetown uh, when? <laughs> 2017, maybe? It took some time. I was there for a while, uh, but that's and met some fantastic people. Um, I am so still based in Washington, D.C. I'm an interactional sociolinguist by training. That's what I call myself. Um, sometimes I also call myself a language strategist. Um, and I am currently a consultant that's focused on messaging strategy and communicating about race and diversity and inclusion. Before I started doing this type of consulting work, I had a brief stint as an adjunct professor uh, at the business school in Georgetown. I was teaching qualitative research methods. And I, uh, after, well, in a, this is, now I'm about to go on, on a tangent, but something that's also been a part of my um, experience outside of academia is kind of having uh, a main hustle and a side hustle. So some of the activities that I've been doing overlap and I forget how they've overlapped. But anyway, um, in addition to doing that, I also spent some time working at a, a think tank here in Washington, DC. So have been doing a lot of consulting and qualitative research outside of the academy. Thanks for having me. I guess it's my turn. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Naeem Tyson. I received my doctorate from the Ohio State University uh, before, before McKinsey, um, way before McKinsey, but I too uh, struggled a little bit and I, I was in the, I was a doctoral student for quite some time. Most of my work revolves around machine learning and natural language processing. Currently, I am a data scientist and machine learning engineer for a small startup called Pymetrics. And I am an assistant adjunct professor in the Department of Computer Science at NYU, where I teach Introduction to Computer Programming to undergraduates. Most of my professional work started before my doctoral studies. I received my master's in computational linguistics from Georgetown. And I was fortunate enough to start my career during the dot-com boom. So since then, I have been a programmer all throughout for, let's just say, for a very long time. While I was a doctoral student, most of my internships had to do with technology pertaining to natural language processing. And then once I became a doctoral candidate, I had jobs working as a software engineer or as a data scientist. And so that's what brings me here today. And thanks for having me. 
Thank you both Mackenzie and Naeem. Mackenzie uh, most definitely uh, affected my time at Georgetown in the most positive of ways. So I'm so glad to see her on the call and to be able to have this moment with her. And I didn't introduce myself in the way of uh, schooling. So um, I went to Georgetown for undergrad. I got my master's at Georgetown. I wanted to teach at Georgetown. So I, I left Georgetown so I could come back as faculty. And I started uh, work, I, went, I started my doctoral program at Michigan State. Um, and I got to work with uh, Geneva Smitherman, which was one of the most life-changing, wonderful experiences ever for me. Um, and then life happened literally and figuratively. I had my daughter who was very, very sick. So I walked away from academia all together. And, um, and then, so unlike the other two panelists, I actually did not start my role as, um, I didn't get my job as a linguist. I actually use linguistics at my job. So it's a little different. Um, and uh, once I was kind of rebuilding my life and figuring out my next steps, a friend of mine from college said, hey, we have this job opening in DC. So I ended up back in, I applied for the job. I didn't get that job. And I ended up being the supervisor of that job a couple months later. Um, and so I came back to DC and I was like, I need to finish this degree. And uh, so I reached out to Georgetown and they're like, we're happy to have you back. Um, so I was able to come back to Georgetown. And it's good to hear that other people are having struggles and it took a while to get the, to get the final step. Um, so it has taken me a while. Life has literally thrown so many curveballs, but I think that's what we're gonna talk about today is being successful as, as part of that is being resilient. Um, and uh, so here I am, and um, and we're going to just kind of throw some questions to the to the panelists. But as you have questions, I mean, I have my my script here or my uh, my list of questions. But we most definitely want to uh, make this useful for you. So throw your questions in the chat box. But first, I just want to um, I want to ask both Mackenzie and Naeem, um, how did you kind of end up in your current role? but also what has been the most challenging and the most successful in your current space outside of, outside of the academy? Um, well, I ended up where I currently am um, as a comb like two forces converge. So one is I was in a really um, toxic work environment and knew that I needed to get out of it uh, and kind of got to the place where I was going to leave it with and just just figure it out after the fact. Um, and then uh, the other force that converged, which I think is useful for a panel like this, is that networks and networking really does work. And so um, I knew someone who knew of a, a, a Kind of consulting project that needed someone um, and they reached out to me and I said yes I'll do it um, and and that's how I got where I am right now. Um, in terms of what has been um, a success I think that something that being a something that I, I think to put it in linguistics terms, I think actually being a variationist at the beginning of my linguistics career was helpful and being able to, um, uh, and one of the things that that, well, one of the things that that helped me with and afforded was being able to have a lot of experience explaining that language is a tool for studying other things. People ask you, you're a variationist, what are you gonna do with that? And uh, being able to explain why I care so much about uh, different pieces of language, why I care so much about data, and what does that mean for you? And so just having practice explaining, yes, I study this thing, but here's what I'm going to do for you with it um, has been really has been really useful. And also even more specifically, uh, a part of my experience as a variationist was talking really explicitly about what the relationship is between language change, race, colonialism, conflict, and that is absolutely, uh, I do that all day, every day, is explain how all of these things relate to each other, and I couldn't have done that without being the type of linguist that I have been. So I ended up at Pi Metrics 
due to, I guess, my falling out of sorts uh, with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And I, as a former employee, I still have to say this, that the opinions that I have are of my own and do not reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I was previously a data engineer there and I was working on some natural language processing projects. So my background as a linguist actually did help working there in that capacity. However, I was not satisfied with the level of service that I was providing to the institution. It had changed drastically since I had started there from software projects to more support based projects. And so I decided to leave there and look for other opportunities, particularly in, as a data scientist or, or in machine learning. So after a few failed attempts, I ended up finding a, a landing spot with Pymetrics. The most challenging part of being back in the space again is the fact that the technology is moving at a pace that I would say is almost, and I hate to use this hackneyed term, but it's almost unprecedented how quickly some of these new net language technologies get pushed out. And the fact that the field has sort of shifted from your traditional linguistics under, underpinnings to more sophisticated structures such as artificial neural networks. But I think with enough training and enough uh, persistence that it can be done and you can learn these new technologies and apply them to your own work. Thank you both. I think it's really, really interesting um, how both of you kind of talk about leaving a space because of various factors um, and, and um, unfortunately negative. And I know all the time we don't transition from one job or one career to another because of negative of, of negative experience but uh in many cases that is whether it be people whether it be the environment um whether it be a certain uh, a task or a certain um uh, uh mindset that the organization or that the um the people in the organization or the leadership have um so one of the things that I know all of us have seen um, and kind of this idea and these mindsets and these shifts that we're, that we're looking at now is DEI, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and I kind of want to get the sense from you, Mackenzie, Naeem, and if others want to join in, because I think it's a really good point of conversation. Um, they're quite perv pervasive, right? They're, they're everywhere, um, good, bad, or otherwise. And so I want to ask you, in your opinion, do you feel the DEI work at your organization or at your, um, maybe not at your current organization, your past organization, do you feel like it's performative or is it productive? And, and, and anyone can chime in here because I think part of this, as we think about how are you going to be successful, um, a lot of these opportunities and these uh, ideas about diversity and, and bringing different kinds of people in um, and making sure everyone has a chance and, and making sure everyone feels included, are we just writing something to write it? Or are we actually writing something to, to put it in place? So I wanna know for you in your current spaces or your past spaces, if you don't wanna speak on your current situation, do you feel like they've been performative um, and we're checking boxes or do you feel like they've actually produced some great, some uh, promising results? Well, I can, I can start with this one if you don't mind, uh, Mackenzie. So I'll, I'll start from the present and I'll work myself, um, work my way back. So Pymetrics basically is a human resource AI talent matching platform where we try to create machine learning models that reduce the amount of bias in hiring. And so with that, by design, the organization has to deal with these DEI initiatives what is unique about their approach is that they're highly, they've sort of outsourced some of it in the sense that they've reached out to another organization to track, if you will, some of the initiatives that have been started because there's volunteer work and then there's also work that's done internally. And then some people are also can, do, can have donations to other organizations. And so it's really refreshing because 
it's it's a commitment that even though it's done by design, there are people who devote some of their own work time to, to diversity within the organization. If you take that experience and you compare it to my time at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, I would say that quite a bit of the most recent DEI activities have been reactionary and not necessarily performative. And what I mean by that is during the time of the protests that followed the, the murder of George Floyd, they sort of stepped up their activities. And what I mean by that is that they had sort of town halls where people were allowed to speak their mind with, with uh, uh, a facilitator that was from outside of the Fed. Well, the, I, see, I see the conflict in this and that the Fed and the entire Federal Reserve System basically is averse to, to getting involved in socio-political movements. And so this is something that they will consistently struggle with. However, in some cases, they did sort of turn a, a blind eye to some of the political activities that employees felt obliged to engage in, that is protests and certain other types of, of positive activism. So I, I will see that type of organization always struggling. However, they do do some performative measures with their affinity groups and also outside of, of those affinity groups. For, um, I was in thinking about my experience, I, um, I've, I've seen a few different things kind of across my time, but if I start in the present, so I'm a consultant and the current project that I am working on is a, was created uh, in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder and the organization that I'm doing this project for, thinking about um, it, what their responsibility to both their employees and also to the wider public was. And so if you, you can look at that set of facts and say that my work is a part of a new chapter in, in DEI work. Um, you could definitely look at it that way. Sometimes I look at it that way and sometimes I don't. Um, but I've also been present in an organization as a staff member, someone who worked there, um, when, when an organization decide, considered starting a DEI kind of work and both deciding to do it, like follow through, and I've also been present when they've thought about it and said, no, we don't, that, like, no, that's not something we need to do. And, and so um, uh, I, it's hard to take that example and, and use it to answer the question you asked, do I think this is performative or not? Um, I, I suppose I'm not really sure what I, what I think about that quite yet, but I've seen, and you know, I've seen um, when I think even farther back and think about my experience as a graduate student. And I, I think as a graduate student, I had the experience of people who I was in school with assuming that my presence in the institution must mean that the department was going through some kind of DEI initiative. Otherwise, why would I be there? Which like, let's be clear, that's ridiculous and grossly offensive. But um, yeah, I've, I, I, those are some of the things that I've seen. Um, I don't think I really answered your question, but I, but I did share. So hopefully that works. No, I, I, um, and as I said a few minutes ago about you um, and Jesse Greaser being very much transformative and influential in uh, in the program, because after you left, I was the only one and um, at, at Georgetown. And I think um, 
really those that what you just said really speaks to it's not necessarily answering the question, but it's your thoughts. And I think it's really about these spaces. And I don't think this is a cut and dry, let's answer the question. If we can peg that the work that we're doing, the statement that we put out, are you just putting the statement out because we have to check a box? Are you putting the statement out because now you're going to put some infrastructure behind it to actually uh, promote change? And so what I liked, uh, what I really appreciated was when Naeem said it wasn't necessarily performative, but it was reactionary. And unfortunately, the, the problem is is I think many times we become firefighters, right? Instead of making the house flame retardant. So um, we, we, instead of like saying, you know what, we're going to make sure that we help uh, create a, a infrastructure, we create a system around making sure that we include others and we create an environment that in, embodies different people. When something comes up, such as the murder of George Floyd, or even when we were dealing with Ferguson and, and how that set a different spark of responses, we reacted to it and we didn't have something in place to say, you know, what well, now let's talk about this and how does this fit in our current structure? We had to build something, we had to create something. And that's why you see, um, you see that, and even here, I work with an organization, our employees, um, we have about 120 employees um, and our peak, we have about 200 over the summer. And um, it's about 75% non, non-white um, for our employees and our young people that we serve are 92% white. Um, and I think we are getting to a place now as we're shifting our culture here, but even as an organization that serves a lot of black and brown staff and young people, we're very much behind and we are very much reactionary. And I think in some ways we have been performative. We say the right things because, because we're, we hide behind the brand. And I think, I think that in the last, for me, and I'm actually at, at work and I'm very comfortable about, about saying this because I've shared this, right? Um, and so it's, I'm not saying anything that I haven't said to, to leadership and to HR, but I think what's really, really important is how do we become the biggest advocates in the room and the biggest action like the biggest forces of action for young people and our staff so they see that we're not just putting up a, a statement on our website but we're doing this each and every day in the 15 sites that we serve in our virtual space um and so i really like this idea i don't like that this is the, this is the reality but i really like the way you articulated that naeem that is reactionary um and maybe not as performative once well, it is is cut and dry perform, uh, performance, but in some cases we are just reacting to what's happening as opposed to creating these intentional, um, I think as Alexa said, these intentional spaces and conversations and systems around how do we do this work. Um, I want to, does anyone in the audience have anything that want to add to that um, to articulate? Because I want to build on that question in a different kind of way. All right, so thinking about, and I think Alex, you alluded to this in the chat, kind of thinking about these affinity groups or uh, these employee resource groups, right? Like, do they, do you feel like, um, so Black, African American, um, certain gender identities in the workplace, uh, Asian, Asian American, um, has anyone really, for Mackenzie and for Naeem and others who may have experienced this, have any of you, um, do your jobs offer these types of groups? Um, also, if so, what has been your experience? And um, and then have they been useful? Have they been helpful? Have they been harmful? So if you've experienced them, what has been your experience? And do you think it's a positive or negative one? Um, and then I wanna open that up to others because I know organizations, academies um, may all function a little differently. So I want to ask Mackenzie and Naeem first, but I would like some others to, um, I would like some others to, to respond as well, because I think this is a really important conversation about, about kind of um, the space, the space of the professional space. Sure. So I've never been a part of uh, a formal, you know, employee resource group. So either Either they have not existed or, um, or I haven't been able to join one because as a consultant who mostly works on a contract or freelance base, I'm not a full-time employee, which means that I'm not able to participate when these kinds of, um, in those kinds of groups. Now that, I mean, that uh, scenario tells you a lot about, um, that's another, 
important, the structure of labor is another important piece of this conversation um, about equity uh, and inclusion, but um, I've never been a part of a formal resource group. Now I have been, of course, a part of the like informal, you know, meeting after the meeting of uh, the, you know, the people and the folk. Um, but, but no, I've never been a part of a um, employee resource group. So I too had that same issue when I first started at the at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where as a contractor, I could not participate in those those types of groups. However, once I became full time, I was able to do so. The issue that I had with our affinity groups, and this goes back to the theme of being performative versus being productive, in that they would they check all the boxes, they are funded in the sense that they have speakers come in and talk at you, but they do not sort of facilitate dialogues and definitive actions that occur after the meeting. And so I alluded to before the conversation or the, the that we had about the social upheaval going on at the time, that should have been a discussion that should have gone on way before the, the, the George Floyd murder. And because this has been a, a consistent theme with that in this country. However, the affinity group I was associated with for some reason did not decide to, to make it a part of their agenda throughout the year. Now at my current position, there seems to be the issue of the forest versus the trees. So yes, there are diversity initiatives within the organization at a very high level. However, at, at the level of the trees, you don't see the engagement or the, the continued engagement with affinity groups of color within the organization. Now, I have my theories as to why that is the case. One theory being that we're all remote and we don't necessarily have the opportunities to, to do that on an ongoing basis. There also is a Slack channel, but the problem with the Slack channel is that it's, it's sort of, it's the equivalent of a breakout room in Zoom. You have to be assigned in order to feel included and not, it's not necessarily a, a inclusion by your own, uh, your own choice. And the affinity group that is, and it's called the Latinx group, well, the problem is, is that I'm not Latinx. So it doesn't, any conversations there don't necessarily apply to me. So I can only call it an affinity group in name, but not in its own action. For our others who are in the academy or beyond, um, do you have anything that you want to add and um... Ashley and Jordan, we most definitely will circle back when you are ready. I could go ahead and chime in really quickly just on the ideas of being performative, uh, being reactionary rather than being prepared. And uh, I have definitely tried to reflect on that myself and I try to talk to others about how I'm handling certain situations, um, but I do feel that it's performative. And sometimes I feel like it's that same kind of um, imposter syndrome situation. And I don't know if you all can kind of check in on that, but in some cases when I haven't really seen others demonstrating or modeling, I, I do get that sense of being performative, but am I in fact actually setting up better practices or um, am, am I perpetuating, like you said, more and more so being performative? I don't know if anyone else can the point about demanding better practices and, and keeping the, um, the, frankly, advocacy and internal activism around um, practices is really important. And I think that that is, um, that is what, being, of course, you know, being able to change practice and how it is that people inside of organizations and institutions are going to 
um, you know, relate to one another. Like that's the, I think for me, some of the, in a lot of cases, that's the ultimate, the ultimate goal and the ultimate work. And is a lot of, again, in my experience, um, some of what gets talked about in, in the pre-meeting and the post-meeting is, you know, how, how did what relates to the, the, the meeting um, or what happened in the meeting? How does that relate to things that we don't see, need to see, want to see, are going to keep pushing for and talking about? Um, and, and how can we change practice to match what we know would create a better, a better experience? Uh, at the, I posted a little bit, but at the University of Arizona, we've been dealing with this, and all of this is in response, I think most of it at least is in response to uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, and it's an opportunity that's come along where the C-suite is really, is, is ready to have conversations and to do things. But I was smiling because of uh, the post about, you know, the small, the, the small amount of money that gets, gets done. So what I tried to do, I'm the one who got stuck with like doing all of the organizing. So I was like, you know, I came from an institution, UTSA, where we had a black faculty and staff association and I served in that. And then I came to University of Arizona and black folk don't really get together and do anything. And I was like, no, we gotta change that. Black women gotta come together, we gotta do stuff. We gotta go out to brunch and all of this. And then of course the pandemic hit and shut a lot of stuff down. Um, and then, you know, Freedom Summer came, and then I feel like institutions were ready to have conversations, that they weren't necessarily engaging in, in any real way before. And so what was, what was difficult for me is having to say the same thing over and over, right? It's like, none of this is new. <laughs> don't ask me to do work. Like, don't ask me to teach you how to do better when this is not new, go find it. You're researchers, you're scholars. You can't find a book. You don't know how to use a database to find the stuff that you want when it comes to this, right? So that's kind of been my constant thing with that. But the fact that they're at the table and listening and I've seen movement, of course they deal with the easy stuff first, right? Okay, we'll give you money for a Sankofa group. I didn't want to say, I don't need to say, like, I don't, I was like, I don't need you to help me get Black folk together. We can come together on our own. What I do need to do is make like substantive change, right? And that's where the difficult conversations come in. And so we've seen some movement on that, right? You know, they're committing to a cluster hire, they're committing to creating something like the uh, UC postdocs. Uh, they're committing to, you know, one of the other things is we that's come up in here is about people's inequitable statuses. And so one of the things that pushed for was there are faculty here right now who are uh, contingent faculty who want to be um, a tenure track faculty. Let's, you know, let's shop here first. And so they've done some of that as well. So they're you can see some change, some things that are going on, but it really, you know, getting the big stuff, like, you know, we need to deal with, you know, these inequitable tenure and promotion guidelines. Like that's a real thing, right? We need to deal with these problems with funding. We are, we are on Native American land. It's a land grant institution. You stole this land, right? And the, you know, another thing that's contributed to this are the faux pas by people in the C-suite like the provost and the president. The provost actually at one point said to, where they were meeting with the Native American uh, group and told them, oh, we give all of this money to um, indigenous communities and, you know, we'll never ever get that money back. And I'm just like, you know, so they had to like sit through a meeting, the Native uh, student group that did this had the faculty members and people from the community in a meeting with the provost and essentially lecturing them on this is how you messed up. And so they're having to like do all of this work now. But it's, it's like, this is it's not new. You've made these things, you've done these mistakes, you've done these things before, but at least now we can hold, try to hold you accountable. But it really is about, you know, people have to show up and they have to stick together and say, you know, we're going to hold you accountable for the work that you need to do. 
Um, no, I think, I think so many of the things that you just said, Sandra, and I remember I came to you for some advice about a year ago and, and you were very consistent in that advice. Um, and to hear, and, and almost using the exact same words and to hear, to hear you say it again, um, I think it really resonates is we know how to do the research. It's just about what we're researching, um, and what we choose to research and what we choose to find the solutions to, and what we choose to or even not even find the solutions, but what we choose to try to solution. Um, and it's not all about, um, it's not all about um, getting the right answer, but it's that you're trying to, to, to get there and that you're making an effort um, and not just assuming that someone else will do the work. And I did see a question in the chat box about, about leaving. Um, and that's, I think that depends on a couple of things. One, depending on your personality, I'm very outspoken um ab about things and you can also and I think Mackenzie talks about how she framed it as that she can't be successful here um and because I am outspoken I often advocate for people who aren't or for people who feel like that they may be at jeopardy uh for some retribution maybe losing their job or something like that and I'm not saying that I'm invincible or in um um or I'm indisposable but I know that there's a lot more security in my in in me being here than, than some others. And like I said, I'm not invincible by any means, but sometimes just having others that you advocate for. Um, we had a diversity training a, a while back and they were talking about what do you think is contributing to this space in a way that's, that, like Mackenzie said, not helping you be successful. Or when people think about diversity, how do you feel hindered? Um, and so one lady talked about not having kids and the other lady talked about having kids, right? So because I have kids, I can't participate in a lot of these just you know, random things that pop up or these after after five or whenever she gets off at six after six, because I have to go home and be mom and wife. And the other the other young woman said, I feel discriminated against because I don't have kids and we, you know, and because I don't have that family. So I get extra work because people know I have time and I have availability. And um, and so it's really this idea of what um, what are we doing to be, um, to think about diversity and what are we doing to set people up in whatever their spaces they are in, right? Whatever your situation is in, I think, um, I think you have to articulate boundaries. I think boundaries really do help, um, mm -hmm. kind of this notion of being successful and saying, although I don't have X or although I do X, that doesn't mean like every person that does X is just like me. Um, and I think, I think that's one of the things that we can't just lump everyone together. And I think that's the the harmful thing about affinity groups and, and also the helpful thing at the same time. I think because we're all black, we're assumed that we're all gonna have the same experiences or because we're all women, we're gonna all have the same experiences. We may have commonalities and we may have common, um, we may have some shared experiences, but I think we have to be very, very careful not to, to lump everybody in the same kind of mold. Um, and, and one of the things is I spoke, I do some consulting work as well. And I, I was, uh, I did, a the black association, I can't remember the exact name, but for a, a pretty large company asked me to come and do a training about to their, to their group about how do we talk to people who essentially what they were, they didn't say it like this, but it kind of came across like this and I had to help them re reframe and reshape their thinking about like when people come in and be in their ghetto. Like, what does that mean? Like, let's unpack ghetto. Like, let's unpack all of these things. What are you saying? And so this is the black group, right? And they're saying, well, I hate working with other black customers. Like, I hate when black customers come in because, you know, they make it a bad name. And so we have to unpack, like, what does all mean? And why, why are you even coming here? And I think, uh, unfortunately, I don't think it should have just been the black affinity group, right? It needed to be others who come and have these same kinds of thoughts because this is coming from somewhere. This is not just an internal thinking. And now you've also helped perpetuate this thinking inside of the organization. So I think that when we think about um, these, these groups and think about this work that we're doing, I think Sandra's very much right. It's not about us doing the work for her, but it's really about, um, it's really about in, in telling others, go do the work. You know how to do the work if you want it to. Um, and really, um, and not saying that you can't uh, be a presence and however you may, you know, uh, decide to navigate in that space, but understanding your boundaries. I think success comes with establishing boundaries and sticking to them. Um, Cause I wasn't very good at that initially. And I think that that was a downfall. Something else that I've been thinking about over just over the last few minutes in this, in the discussion is, um, you know, conversations that I've part, like the conversation about, um, 
why people can't succeed and how that relates to the other point about changing policy and practice that, that we've been talking about. And one of the ways that, um, so if, if I take a step back, I think in places that I've been in or around where I've seen some kind of um, inclusion or equity or diversity um, movement on, um, I've seen just from a strategy perspective, I've seen organizations and people inside of organizations kind of leverage this uh, incredibly terrible myth that companies and institutions are like friendly and um, <laughs> and that uh, and that you know we're a team and we're a family like not true but um, people do leverage that myth to say. Uh, if this is an organization that <clears throat> because we, you know, our family uh, has to care about and be very intentional about how we relate to one another and because we spend a lot of our time here, then this has to be a place that is not like psychologically violent, but is at least, a, it's not psychologically violent and is a place where we can be and be and be okay. And even that conversation, and, and so that, as I see it, can be a strategy for opening up a conversation about what are some of the things that make this a like tolerable environment or not. And the conversation about is this tolerable, I think, I hope, can make some progress on being able to show people in leadership positions that it isn't just enough to like have me on your staff. Like I have to not hate coming to work every day. Um, and, and, and that connects directly to specific policies. And in an instance that came to mind is um, having a conversation, you know, towards the end of my time at, at a job that I left a few months ago, um, I had a conversation about how it was clear to me that I could not succeed because the, the policies of the institution did not see me or think about me at all. And an example was the organization was um, in the process of changing uh, providers for their, for, for their retirement plans. And so in changing providers, uh, and they were changing providers to uh, changing retirement plans. One of the things that was going to happen when the plans changed was that, um, you know, technically you have to cash in your plan and that means you have to pay fees in order to start a new plan. And the organization was only going to pay the fees for cashing out and transferring for people who had been at the organization for more than eight years. All right, so then, okay, whatever. But if you look at the roster, well, the only people who've been at the organization for eight years are, you know, a few people who are, it's a small organization, so a few people who are in leadership positions. So what you end up saying is that everyone who is, um, who's not has to pay a substantial amount of penalties for something that wasn't their decision in the first place. And that's an example of organizations making a choice. You know, you chose who, who you were going to subsidize and who you weren't. And, and, it's, and, and so anyway, that's, that's an example, I hope, I think, um, of, of being able to get into a conversation about, you know, the way things are happening in this organization does not work for me um, uh, through this, this myth of like, y'all think we're friends, um, so. No, I, I think that that I really appreciate um, and the chat is blowing up. And so it's really great to kind of have these parallel conversations about experiences, but also those who are putting them in the chat and then kind of layering on each other's experience, like layering on um, and um, acknowledging and, um, and, and really supporting and respecting people's um, experiences and expecting, uh, respecting, excuse me, what people have dealt with and how they've dealt with it and the 
the diversity we've seen in responses. Um, the other thing I kind of want to talk about is, um, and this is something that I most definitely deal with, and so I'm going to shift the gears just a little bit, um, because when you're in these spaces, I think about being successful is about being resilient, like I said before, but part of that is also kind of charting your own course and imposter syndrome and um, being um, imposter syndrome is very, very real. And I think we experience it. I won't say everyone. Some people may not, but I think for those who experience it, it may manifest itself differently. So for our panelists or for any of the attendees in the room, um, how have you used or how has how do you see imposter syndrome kind of set you back a little bit? And then how do you feel like you've bounced back if you have or if you're seeking advice on how to bounce back from from this uh, from kind of being the being the thinking about the imposter being the imposter in the room? And I most definitely can speak to my own experience, but I want to give the floor to some others first. So for me, being in a field that is usually dominated by people who are not from my ethnic background, I do have instances where I do experience uh, imposter syndrome. But then I use one of the tools that has always helped me, and that is networking. If people thought that you were not competent in what you were doing, they wouldn't reach out to you and ask you to do other things. So I always remind people of that. So, you know, whether it be LinkedIn, whether it be Facebook or whatever, whatever your primary networking mechanism is. The second tool that I've required actually is from my own, in my own, uh, interest in just learning a, a new word uh, for, for the day, whether it be Spanish or English. And one of the words I learned today was the word bon yip, uh, B-U-N-Y-I-P. And its etymology comes from an Aboriginal word that means monster, but it, when it came into English, it actually means an imposter. And so what I will tell people on this call and people whom I see in my own travels is that you are not a monster. You're there for a reason. You're sitting there for a reason. And that reason is not for nothing. So take that for what it is and keep moving. Definitely. Um, I, I think my comment is the same is definitely keep, definitely keep, um, keep moving. And I, um, I think, you know, something that helps me keep moving honestly is um thinking about i i do you know honestly believe that i am my the dreams of my ancestors and that really does uh go a long way um in terms of like pushing me into into spaces that are uncomfortable and you know saying things like or having post-its around, you know, saying things like, you can do this, you, you're going to do this, this is going to happen. Um, and I think that, and also to the point of networking, and sometimes the, the meeting before and after the meeting, um, it's important to find people who you can connect with, who can remind you of that, or at least who you know are um, pushing through uncertainty themselves. Um, and be able to have some space somewhere where you can like exhale and um, just just exhale. Um, and and that's that's really important and restorative because whatever confidence we have, um, any any you know grace we have is is a has to be renewed. These are all finite things if we don't, find ways to replenish them, um, they won't replenish. And that's, I think that's an important antidote, but yes, um, I've definitely, so I've definitely experienced um, imposter syndrome, but also, and this might be a little controversial, but I think also in getting through imposter syndrome, I have also been very intentional about thinking of ways of, describing myself and my skills and who I am and why I should be in a place that is kind of, um, how do I say this? That is, or uh, 
well, scratch that, I'll say it like this. In my experience, I have seen organizations be very interested in my skills and who I am in my persona because they haven't met very many people like me. I'm maybe I'm the first or I'm the second or they're haven't, they're, they're, they haven't met very many people like me. And it can be tempting to, you know, pull that into my, um, my own drive and my own narrative. However, I also don't want my drive and my narrative to be at the expense of someone else or to not create space for the oodles of people like me that there are, right? And so um, in that's also, I think, a part of keeping that confidence and forward momentum going is not having it be about, you know, whether or not someone like me has been present in this space before, but being driven by the other parts of my experience and my other connections um, in like to my ancestors, for example, uh, in this world. I know the chat is is really hopping and popping. Anybody want to speak out uh, speak out loud? Um, I actually just wanted to kind of say with the imposter syndrome, um, and I feel like I'm in the right space to to talk about this, but just the even with the colorist aspect of it, um, I run into that when it comes to addressing um, issues of diversity and inclusion, specifically mm. in terms of imposter syndrome as kind of what I was alluding to earlier. Um, I mean, of course, in other positions, um, as far as my skill set for the job specifically, but in addressing certain issues, um, I feel that uh, in, in many cases, and, and, and even I, I have been, um, it, it comes up in, in different ways, just that I will take on efforts to address certain things, um, but I, I might not be the best person to, to do that, to communicate what I'm supposed to be defending most effectively. I think that, um, and, and let's all just piggyback on a point that just came up and then I, I see your hand all the way raised up. So one of the things is um, I love going to conferences, LSA, um, in wave and the, the black linguists, right? Because um, in a department uh, where, I mean, I'm not the only one now, but for a couple of years, it was just me. And I didn't have that space, not in a day-to-day, -day, right? Where I didn't have a, a black faculty or I didn't have um, other black students to kind of go to and, and talk with. And so when we had some new black students come in, I really tried to make sure that we created that space um, because that's what I didn't have. Um, but the other thing is, and the reason I bring of LSA and N-Wave is Sanja um, and they've been really great about creating this space for Black linguists to come together and, and um, be in a space to learn and to, uh, to just vibe. Like Tracy just said, cultivating um, your tribe that really just pumps you up, gasses you up. And uh, last year, uh, two years ago, or was it two years ago, right before COVID? So last January, we were in New Orleans and um, Sanja and Ann hosted a, a, a panel about being Black in linguistics. And um, and I was just a, I think I was, I summed up a, the, a group or whatever, but it was one of the most rewarding um, academic experiences that I had ever had because I saw all of these amazing Black linguists doing things that I was doing, but we weren't talking about our research. We were talking about how do we get through and navigate the academy? How do we support each other? How do we, you know, from coming in as a grad student to being senior faculty, whatever that trajectory has looked like for the different individuals that were on that panel and it was really really helpful and I think that um, right now just imposter syndrome is is crazy it's real especially I know for me um, but I have some amazing people in my my corner that are you know they always send just at the right time they send those encouraging messages or something amazing happens or you get that acknowledgement and you're like that's what I needed um, so finding that circle I think in, in this whole conversation is about being successful these are all tips about being successful. Find that person in your organization, in your department, uh, in your back corner, wherever you need to do in the back alley, whatever, wherever your space is that you love to, to be in, find that person that's going to, to kind of 
pick you up on those down days because the down days, if you stay down too long, you never get back up. And so finding that circle, finding that group. And um, so I appreciate uh, Sanja and Anne organizing that panel and now organizing uh, ongoing um, the African-American language and linguistics uh, symposium kind of conference um, that goes on every year and now the so black and um, so many different opportunities that I think you can that we can plug into to stay gassed up as, as Tracy said um, to combat uh, to most definitely combat this very real thing of imposter syndrome and however it may manifest for you Alexis and then we'll go to Mackenzie uh, I just wanted to bring a point to say that when we're talking about imposter syndrome, particularly, it's incredibly imperative that we remind ourselves that we are in spaces that were not designed for us. Um, so just being there, like no one woke up and created these universities or created these um, public sector or private sector positions in a way for us to succeed. So just by, yes, the the groups, the individuals, the meeting together, because many to your point, you said the conversation wasn't about your work. It was trying to, um, to succeed in, in, in white spaces, in spaces that were not for us um, and continue to have policies and procedures that are not for us. So by your presence, by your work, by your authority, by all of these things, um, it's, it should be easier when you approach it to say uh, systematically and systemically, I am not supposed to be here. And if you try to keep that frame in mind, that has been really helpful for me to say, well, against all odds, against whatever you have put forward or designed or tried or uh, you, you have failed. So I think that's really helpful on like a broader scale to keep in mind that um, it's it's not for it's not for you and here you still stand. Thank you, Alexis uh, and Mackenzie. Um, something else that I, uh, factors into this is even looking at the imposter syndrome that is looking at the, the the metrics we kind of hold ourselves up to and this is related to Alexis what you're saying about this space was not was not built for you and the 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 rules of this space like don't even don't even see you um and also thinking about, you know, what are even the expectations I have about myself and I the way that I kind of realized that my, one of the ways that I realized that I was looking at the wrong things is I, um, you know, I'm, I'm a linguist. So I did a little experiment in my workplace at the time. And I started um, like uh, praising myself in meetings for getting things done on time. And you might say like, why would you do that? Like you're supposed to get things done on time. But if you look at this as like, as like what are rules? Oppression out the window, right? So if you look at it that way, then yeah, finishing a project on time really is the most amazing thing in the world. And it felt really strange at first to be like talking about this because people are not used to hearing you talk about yourself in this way. There's a lot of, uh, they're not used to, people are not used to hearing that kind of discourse from me. But I think just in that experiment, I realized that in terms of, if I just left it to what I normally would think was worth celebrating, I would not talk about myself at all. And like clearly that's not gonna help. So let's try something else of being excited when you, yeah, when you when when you show up, when you finish things. Um, and uh, yeah, so finding um, because you know, none of us are, you could say none of us are supposed to be here. So if you look at it like that, everything you do is uh, is gold from a unicorn's mouth and talk about it in that way. 
Okay, the gold from the unicorn's mouth. I'm going to need to use that. I will uh, quote you, uh, Dr. Price, on that as we um, as we start to coin that and use that. Um, I, I really, I mean, there we can always ask more questions and more questions, but I want to kind of do a uh, summative question and then we can uh, really open the floor for just some final dialogue for the next few minutes. Um, look, and, and we've kind of done this already, so this may be this may sound s silly a little bit, but if there's that one piece of advice, right? So the panel, this panel was real, or this conversation was really the the notion of being black and successful beyond beyond the academy. But we have a lot of people who are in the academy, and that may be the trajectory that some people on this uh, on the call decide to go, and 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 some of us may decide never to go back to the academy once you leave. Whatever, whatever your preference, we love you and we still gonna support you through it all. But uh, for Mackenzie and Naeem, can you give one piece of advice um, on, on how we can uh, take this conversation and apply it tomorrow, apply it in an hour, apply it in five minutes, right? Apply it in six months. One piece of advice or one, or one takeaway that you wanna leave us with um, before we kind of open the floor for open open dialogue and open conversation. I think that my piece of advice is something that I came into this conversation with and um, have seen evidence of in this conversation is that networks really do work. Um, and, and this is another place where sometimes to fully embrace the power of a network, you have to change what your expectations, like lower your self standards and change what you think is appropriate or needs to happen because the bar is lower than you could ever imagine. And what I mean by that is like, you know, there might be a voice in your mind that says, is it polite to send someone a LinkedIn request and ask, like, who cares? Just do it. Like that, bam, connection, networks, work um and and also even the the length and the strength and the duration of the ties um don't function the way you think they do so case and point tracy connor when was the last time we saw each other i honestly don't remember but we are in each other's network and when we got on the zoom today it was as if like time what is it right it, it doesn't matter and so um, networks and reaching out, talking to people, even just saying, I want to talk to you about this thing I saw on Medium or on LinkedIn, or uh, I have a question about whatever. The worst, the worst thing that can happen is that they like take some time to respond to your message, maybe, but, but having a network, and by that I really mean um, saying hello to people uh, and talking to them about the things that are on your mind um, is so important and facilitates both opportunities, but also um, advice and support and feeling connected and seen. And it is, uh, it took me a while to really learn this lesson and believe it, but it is so, it is so, important. So I guess the piece of advice I give to everyone on this call is to be so great that you cannot be ignored. And I came to this piece of advice because of my own struggles during my, my tenure as a doctoral student. I had issues getting my my general's papers approved. And at, this, at, at Ohio State, we had two pre-general's papers before you can take a general's exam. And I couldn't understand why I had these issues. So I looked up in the department manual and I said, well, what is the acceptance criteria to get these papers approved? And there was one criteria that they, right, well, excuse me, one criterion that they had where if your paper is accepted by a journal or conference of your peers, then it is automatically accepted. So I took up that challenge and I said, look, every one of these papers is going to be in a conference or, or a journal. And so my first one was accepted to the Interspeech conference. And as a result of that, my advisor 
couldn't do, it didn't have the luxury of delaying the acceptance of the papers anymore. So he eventually he, he signed off on the first one. The second paper after a certain number of revisions was accepted into a journal. And so he at faculty meetings, people would question him, what's, what's the deal here? He, he passed the requirement, why don't you pass him? And then eventually he, he caved and he did it. And so that's really the call to action I give to all of you who are on the call. And I'll give you another example. So Janice had mentioned earlier about a case where so if you suffered any type of bias or racism and you left a job, well, I had a job where they left me and they told me outright one day, we don't need a scientist anymore. We need more developers. And this is after I had come up, I had helped them with four different patents for the same company, four of them. All of them were my, I was basically the primary inventor on all of them. And so they left me and I, I had no, I didn't put up much of a fuss about it. Six months later, I get an email from one of their patent attorneys asking me, oh, can you help us with one of these patents? We're having some issue. Guess what my answer was? So in, in this case, there could, they did not have a way of getting rid of me entirely. They had to deal with me. And so my call to all of you, regardless of whether or not you, you win or you lose in your career, be so great that they cannot ignore you or your accomplishments because those accomplishments will last you for longer than you may think. Both of those, so Mackenzie telling us about the importance of your network. Um, one, of my, one of my friends who, um, he always says your net worth your network is your net worth, right? Um, and really who, it's not about what you have, but it's about who you know and how they can help you get to where you want to be. Um, and then Naeem is, is letting us know to be so great that you cannot be ignored. And I think my piece of advice um, will be your journey is your journey. It's uniquely yours. My journey has been super crazy. Hills, valleys, we went to grandma's house five times, we came back. Um, and then, you know, we crossed the ocean and then we sank a little bit and then we rose up and, and all of those things, right? But it has been uniquely mine. There may be one or two things I would change um, just because they are things that were in my control, but a lot of it I couldn't control. And I think because of that, I'm able to reach more people and I'm able to talk to more people and help people understand going through a program with medical challenges, having a child who is, you know, has a lot of medical needs um, or whatever your situation may be, there are other people who are dealing with those things. And because I was able to kind of talk about my experience openly, that helps somebody else. So be comfortable in your own journey. My journey is not like Tracy's, not like Mackenzie's, not like Naeem's, not like Sanja's, not like Marcus, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to, and it took me a long time to be okay with that. Um, and the last piece of advice in, um, is actually, I was meeting with my daughter's neurologist and he said, stop mourning over what you never had. And what he was saying is, you know, my daughter uh, has different abilities um, and her, she has, uh, her cognitive ability is, is lower than others. And he said, stop trying to want the perfect daughter. Stop wanting her to be like every other child. Love her and celebrate who she is. And when you think about this, and, and he said, stop mourning what you never had. Um, because she's teaching you lessons that you will never, that you never could have learned any other way. And, um, and I'm sitting in the hospital, like we're in the hospital and I'm sitting looking at this man. And at first I was like, why is this man coming to do this little test with her? You know, we already know what's going on. And I left that room like nearly in tears because he made me pivot my thinking, right? Like she's never going to be, you know, what every other kid is going to be. And I, and I love her for that because she's taught me never to want to be what anybody else is going to be. So enjoy your journey and, and embrace your own individual journey and um, stop mourning what you never had. I think that those are super, super um, critical lessons. And I think in doing those things, you can be successful and you will be successful because success for all of us looks different. There are, there are 13 people on this call at this, or I'm sorry, there's 26 people on this call right now and there are 37 definitions of success right? Because each of us in our own minds, we're not, 
we have our own definition of success and then we have two more. And so I think it's really, really important just to be successful, whatever that means to you, embrace your own journey, get your network um, and just be great, be great. And so with that, I will, we have most definitely others have comments, uh, questions, concerns, funny stories, amazing stories, inspiring moments, please share them. We are here. Um, you know, and we are here to support each other, lift each other up and to enjoy this space and, and to get through this Wednesday. Thank you, Mackenzie and Naeem for joining me. Um, I really appreciate you have been amazing conversation. And uh, like you said, we should all be everybody, please feel free to join me on LinkedIn or whatever you need to do. And uh, we'll stay here. And thank you so much, everybody for coming and spending your hour and a half with us this Wednesday afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you.